Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the AIA 2019 Documents Webinar, Understanding the Changing Roles of the Construction Manager. And during this webinar, we'll be discussing the new Construction Manager as Advisor document. Before we get started, there's a few administrative items we'll go over. First off, this presentation is protected by copyright laws. This program is also registered with the AIA for one learning unit. When you registered for the webinar, you entered your AIA member number if applicable. We will use that information to report your credit directly to the AIA within a week. So if you are an AIA member, you entered your member number when you registered for the webinar, and we will use that information and report your credit directly to the AIA. This webinar is also being recorded. We will send you a follow-up email this week with the recording as well as the PDF of the PowerPoint, so you will receive that information as a follow-up. With no further ado, I'd like to turn it over to one of our presenters, Susan Van Bell. Susan? Thank you, Hasti, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for deciding to join us today. I'm Susan Van Bell, Senior Director and Counsel for the AIA Contract Documents Program at the AIA. And with me today is Arlen Solacek, FAIA. Arlen is the former Associate Vice Chancellor for Capital Planning at the Maricopa County Community College District in Arizona. And he was also co-chair of the Documents Committee group that updated our CM family of documents. So uh, you'll be hearing the information from the insider today. Next slide, please. I'm not gonna go over the learning objectives in detail. I'll assume you read them when you signed up for the program. But generally speaking, today you will hear about the roles, responsibilities, and relationships between the owner, architect, and the construction manager as they are linked through the coordinated set of CMA documents. I might also add you'll hear about the role of the multiple contractors that will generally be involved in this type of project. We hope to increase your familiarity with these documents and how they help to meet the challenges in the CMA delivery method. Next slide, please. Uh, we'll talk about the expanded scope of services for the construction manager in the updated C-132 document. And we'll also talk about two new exhibits that have been published by the AIA, um, originally published in the 2017 release and now carried forward into this release of the CM documents. One is the new insur insurance and bonds exhibit and the other is the new sustainable projects exhibit. Next slide, please. So I wanna give you a quick overview of the documents program. Uh, we find that folks generally appreciate getting a little bit of an insider's view of, of how we do these things. Next slide. Next slide, please, Husky, there we go, thank you. So the AIA documents have been around since 1888. Um, we consider them to be the industry standard. They have been around for so long. And one of the benefits of that is that they have been evolved as changes in practice have evolved and also as the law has evolved. And part of what we do when we update the documents is look at any changes in practice and the law that may have occurred since the document was last updated. We now have nearly 200 agreements and forms that we publish. Um, the documents program has grown to reflect the complexity of the construction industry and the number of documents have grown accordingly. Next slide, please. Our objectives when we draft a new document or when we update an existing document to keep our documents, what we consider to be the industry standard, is to have them be fair and balanced and to balance competing interests. So I, I'll talk about this a little on the next slide. We reach out to various components of the industry, stakeholders in whatever documents we're working on to get the perspective from different parties. And then we balance you know, the competing needs. And then we generally try to put the risk where it is best managed, which often involves looking at what risk is insured and what party can carry that insurance. Next slide, please. 
our drafting process involves um, seeking input from, as I mentioned before, stakeholders in the industry for the particular documents we're working on. We start with our documents committee members, our, our AIA staff attorneys, uh, and our outside legal counsel and advisors, and then we also bring in other uh, stakeholders. So it's an iterative process where we draft a document in-house, we send it out to third-party liaisons for review, we consider their comments, make edits to the documents, and keep that process just keeps going until the documents committee approves the document. And it generally takes, you know, one or more years for every document that we work on because um, of the length of this process and the detail. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, the participants, uh, well, we, we also do market research. I hadn't mentioned that before. We do market research as well to try to determine what documents we might want to publish that there's a need for. Um, we also consider comments to our DocInfo service. If any of you have used DocInfo, we do have people who call and say, do you have a document for a particular topic? And if we don't, uh, we may consider whether there's a need for that document. So we go out to industry stakeholders, AIA members, things like the knowledge communities, subject matter experts, and then our documents committee, which is comprised of about 30 architects from around the country from different practice types. So we get the input. You know, we're trying to develop standardized documents here that can be used throughout the country. And so we want input for regional differences. Um, as well as perhaps legal differences in, in different parts of the country, and then develop documents that we hope will satisfy all of those requirements. So with that, uh, Arlen will now give you an overview of the construction management delivery method. Thanks very much, Susan. I'm very excited to be part of the webinar today with everybody. Um, let's get going on our discussion on construction manager project delivery in the associated AI construction manager document families. Asti, next slide, please. Owners now have a much wider choice of construction delivery options beyond traditional bid. Nearly three quarters of project delivery decisions are made before design begins when owners are able to look at the risks associated with the project and weigh the advantages or disadvantages of potential construction delivery methods. Alternative delivery, like design build, construction manager constructor, and construction manager advisor, which we'll call CMA for short, have become much more attractive to owners that want to reduce disputes and claims, as well as obtain better budget and schedule results. While not quite as popular as construction manager constructor, CMA still managed to book nearly $24 billion in revenue last year among ENR's top 100 construction management for fee companies. Next slide. Design and construction complex projects are requiring many more parties right now, making the resulting project structure more complex. Most of you are already familiar with traditional design bid build, where the owner selects the architect first to design the project and produce the construction documents. And the owner then solicits bids to, sol to select the contractor. The A201, the, re the gray rectangle in the middle of the diagram, provides the general conditions that define and coordinate the roles, responsibilities, and relationships between the owner, architect, and contractor. For this in the following relationship diagrams, We've also shown the primary AI agreement numbers between the parties, as well as showing all of the documents that are used for the list delivery in print that's probably too small for anybody to read, but it will be on the slides for everybody's reference. So keep this diagram in mind as we look at the other delivery options. Next slide. The second delivery option that we're showing today, but only briefly discussing, is construction manager as constructor, or what we'll call CMC for short. Susan and I presented the CMC webinar in November, and it's posted on the AIA Documents Learn site if you're interested in hearing about more details. You see in this diagram that the parties and relationships pretty much are the same as in a traditional bid project. 
But the difference in CMC is that the construction manager is selected early and becomes part of the project team during the design phase, which we call pre-construction. There is an additional agreement between the owner and construction manager that establishes pre-construction phase responsibilities. The construction manager then becomes responsible for constructing the project. The center rectangle still is the same A201 general conditions that we used in traditional bid once the construction begins. Next slide. During the pre-construction phase, the CMC acts as in an advisory role to the project team, providing expertise in cost estimating and scheduling, constructability and biddability reviews of the architect's work, subcontractor selection, and even possible early releases of work. Once the construction price proposal is accepted by the owner, the construction manager transitions to a, tra a traditional contractor role. There are two pricing options available under CMC. The first is one that caps the owner's cost exposure through a guaranteed maximum price, or GMP. The cap cost proposal uses the A133 Owner Construction Manager Agreement. When AIA receives calls asking whether there is a CM at risk set of documents, the at risk really means that there's a GMP cap on the contract sum in the A133 agreement is what we'd use. The second option is for pure cost of the work pricing with no cap, where the A134 agreement is used. We find CMC most often used for a larger complicated project, especially one that needs a high level of similar project experience due to technical complexity, or for projects that are schedule sensitive, or projects with different cult or unusual site constraints. Next slide, Hasty. Now let's look at construction manager advisor, the topic of our webinar today. CMA is appropriate when an owner uses multiple direct to owner contracts to build the project. This may be an owner's choice or a statutory requirement as we found in a number of states. The project now incorporates a fourth primary player on the project team, the construction manager advisor. This makes the diagram, frankly, and as well as the entire delivery process, more complicated than either traditional bid or CMC. The A232 General Conditions Agreement, again shown in the center gray rectangle, coordinates the roles and responsibilities of all parties during construction, but it is written to take into account the CMA's role and multiple contractors on the project. Next slide. While it seems easy to understand CMA delivery, there are a number of wrinkles that often cause some head scratching. Let me provide two frameworks to keep in mind as we discuss CMA. First, under CMA, the construction manager is retained at the start of the project, serving as another direct to owner consultant and advisor to the entire project team. This is somewhat similar to the architect situation. During pre-construction phase, the CMA also provides many of the same services that a construction manager constructor might. Then once construction begins, the CMA assumes many of the general contractor's roles to manage, supervise, and coordinate the multiple contractors, but without the risk or liability for providing the construction itself. Second, while we have multiple contractors on the project, each individual contractor sort of sees itself as the single direct to owner contractor, but still understanding that there are other contractors on the project that they have to cooperate and coordinate with through the owner's project manager, the CMA. Next slide. A lot of us don't use the term construction manager as advisor, but AIA tries to use general descriptive titles for their document families. In our own document task group, we realize that there are a number of names used for CMA delivery, including CMA agent, CM agent and agency CM. These are often, often local or regional preferences, but they all fall under the CMA family. CMA is different, however, from a program manager that would be responsible for administering a group of related projects. And it's also different from a basic project manager that would not provide the extensive scope of CMA services or responsibilities. Next, Susan is going to describe the AI's process used to draft and update their forms and agreements. Susan? 
Thank you, Arlen. So now turning specifically to the construction management families of documents, which were, of course, updated in 2019. Um, they are updated every 10 years. So the current versions that are out there are 2009 versions. And by the way, in keeping with our general practice, we retire uh, the, the prior versions of documents after 18 months. So the 2009 documents will be out there for 18 months which gives you time to make the transition to the 2019 documents. Um, the updated 2019 documents are based on the same general drafting uh, goals that I already talked about earlier, but for this specific family, we, you know, there are, there are specific goals we had. Um, one of them is to conform them to the A201 2017 revisions a201 is our general conditions document for the design bid build family. It's the, the biggest group of documents that we have, the most widely used. Those are updated every 10 years. And so the A201 family was updated in 2017. And to the extent that any of the revisions in the A201 family documents are also applicable to the CM documents, we have incorporated them into the CM documents. Next slide, please, Hosty. And then specifically for the CM documents, um, as I discussed earlier, re reaching out to industry stakeholders. We talked to representatives of major construction management firms and construction companies. We had input from CMAA, Construction Management Association of America, and CSI. And then we had input from many attorneys who represent owners, lenders, contractors, design professionals. Most of them are members of the ABA Forum on Construction Law. And we asked these outside liaisons what changes to the existing 2009 documents they would like to see and what practice changes have occurred over the past 10 years that we would now want to incorporate into the 2019 documents. So Arlen is going to now start talking about the actual 2019 updates and how we responded to some of the issues that were raised by the liaisons. Thanks very much, Susan. All right, let's get into some more of the detail on CMA, the reason that all of you have joined us here today. Next slide, Hasti. Everybody recall this slide from a few minutes ago that shows the contractual structure and relationships in a CMA project. With CMA having an additional owner's advisor and multiple contractors, it's really quite different than the structure that we see in either traditional bid or construction manager constructor. Next slide. Next slide, Austin. Thank you. Each family of documents contains a full set of agreements and forms that have been carefully written and coordinated with each other. That's also why we need to be very careful when editing any of the documents, since changes in one may also affect the roles and responsibilities in other documents. Most of these documents are based upon the ones that we use in traditional bid and that you're familiar with, that add the presence of the CMA and multiple contractors. First, there's the lead document of the set, the C-132 owner CMA agreement. The A-132, the construction agreement between the owner and each individual single contractor. The A232, the general conditions for construction, again, between the owner and each individual contractor. The guide for supplementary conditions that provides language for special situations and guidance in preparing general conditions in the construction agreements. And we'll discuss the guide a little bit later in the webinar. The B-132 Owner-Architect Agreement, that's based on the B-101 Owner-Architect Agreement, and a full set of forms created to address the multiple contractor arrangements. There's also a new sustainable project exhibit that includes CMA responsibilities, and Susan will talk about that exhibit in a couple of minutes. Next slide. Thanks. In situations where owners are required to use multiple trade packages, CMA really is the only reasonable and coordinated method for doing this. In the first bullet, complex projects really means that the CMA is providing knowledge and services to manage multiple direct-to-owner contractors, 
We wouldn't use CMA just because it's a complicated project with a single contractor, although we could if we wanted to. Early release or fast track work also was possible by selecting trade contractors during the design phase, similar to what we can do in CMC projects. In our task group's rethinking of CMA delivery, construction contracts no longer are assumed to be fixed bid or low, fixed price or low bid. Our group believed that construction could be cost of the work arrangements, design build packages, maybe even job order task work. In fact, we could foresee a mix of these things all on a single project and that really would make things interesting. So as we updated the CMA agreement, we had to make sure that we were neutral regarding the type of construction delivery that might be used. Next slide. Pre-construction phase starts with the owner selecting both the construction manager and architect. The CMA often is selected first and can provide input to the owner for the selection of the architect and contractors. Architect services pretty much our traditional design, construction documents, and contract administration, but with the additional interaction and coordination with the construction manager and knowledge that more than one contractor is going to be used. Under CMA, a lot of the burden of coordinating information, pay applications, and so forth because of the multiple contractors will fall to the CMA, and this significantly reduces the architect's coordinating work. Reconstruction input from the CMA provides many of the services that a construction manager constructor did during design, including doing the primary cost estimates and schedule input, doing design and constructability reviews, design assist coordination, and helping to scope the contract or work packages. Next slide. Once the construction begins, the CMA provides the same management and coordination of the contractors that a general contractor would for their subcontractors that we find in traditional bid or CMC project. The owner still awards and holds all of the direct owner construction contracts. The CMA is going to have a daily presence at the project site and will become an additional set of eyes and ears on the work for both the owner and architect, augmenting the architect's services. Next slide. The CMA and architect share a number of roles and responsibilities during construction. The end result is that the CMA provides a lot of the daily administrative assistance and analysis, compiling information, and then doing first level assessments and only then forwarding the material when it's ready for the architect's reviews. Next slide. The next, few, the next few slides will show some examples of shared responsibilities, what the construction manager will do, what the architect will do, and what they do together. Our review liaisons in the task group wanted the CMA to have some real responsibility and add value to the process, not just gather paper and pass it along. You'll see the words receive, review, deliver, and more important with some of our updates, make recommendations, and those are now common CMA responsibilities. The architect's responsibilities are shown in the right column and are the customary duties found in the B101 and B103 owner architect agreements. Use of CMA has not altered or reduced these responsibilities. So for an example, the CMA now reviews submittals to make sure that they meet the requirements of the contract documents. This should save the architect a lot of time of having to go through and then reject incomplete submittals, and we've all had to do that. We also want the CMA to do more than just track RFIs. The CMA is supposed to now review each RFI and offer input to the architect for their response. Next slide. In the shared responsibilities middle column, the CMA often either initiates the activity and works with the architect or compiles information that the architect will review and act upon in their traditional role. So here's a couple of additional examples of CMA administrative responsibilities. It's important to note in the first line that prepare change orders means preparing the change order in CCD form only. The architect still is responsible for preparing any technical information that needs to be attached, including specifications, descriptions, and drawings. We've increased the CMA's role in quality control as well. The CMA now can reject non-complying work on his or her own, 
not just observe and report it to the architect to have the architect reject it. Last, the CMA receives and compiles the pay applications from all of the contractors, then reviews and compiles them into a summary pay application, and the CMA certifies that application before forwarding it to the architect for review and final processing. Next slide. The CMA's expanded quality control responsibility also includes producing a preliminary punch list and providing the initial groundwork for the architect. How many times have all of us visited a project site to prepare a punch list only to find that the project wasn't really ready yet? Now, we expect that the CMA would let the contractor and architect know that the project isn't ready yet for punch list, certificate of substantial completion, or final inspection, and save the architect the extra work and visit. Next slide. Let's look at some specific updates and changes to the 2019 Owner Construction Manager Agreement, the C-132. Next. As we discussed, many of the CMA services are very much like what a general contractor provides, including the CMC services, CMA services during the pre-construction phase. Insurance requirements, which generally are similar to the architects, Continuous fill points, but with updated requirements and insurance industry changes. Next slide. Because the CM CMA is another professional advisor to the owner, we made a number of changes to the C-132 to keep it parallel with the changes we made to the 2017 B-101 and B-103 owner architect agreements. Supplemental and additional conditions are services which are not basic services for the CMA, but can be added to respond to specific project needs. We've updated and split the prior long list that all used to be grouped under additional services. Supplemental services now are the services that are known and contracted for at the time of the original agreement execution. These might include some things such as the CMA providing measure drawings of an existing building, providing commissioning services, or assistance with FF&E. Additional services now are the services identified later in the project. These might include things like revisions due to late changes in building codes, attendance at public hearings, or preparation and attendance at a dispute resolution proceeding. Next. Termination for construction for convenience now includes a termination fee that is negotiated at the time of the original agreement instead of basing the compensation on the hard to prove anticipated profit model that we had in prior versions. Last, our liaisons were pretty clear in telling us that the, the past agreements often lacked a strong direction and clarity of the CMA's roles and responsibilities. We started our updating process by drafting a simple, strong guiding principle that's shown in the last bullet point. Next slide, Hosting. Multiple direct-to-owner contractors is where the deep details of CMA operation often gets conceptually complicated. Past versions of the owner CMA agreement and general conditions use both the term contractors and multiple prime contractors, and this really created a lot of confusion. Our task group determined that the words multiple and prime really weren't needed, and we changed to just contractor or contractors where more than one contractor is being addressed throughout all of the documents. While the CMA is managing and coordinating more than one contractor, from each individual contractor viewpoint, it's still a one-to-one -one relationship between the owner and the contractor being managed by the CMA and coordinated through the A232 general conditions. We also were asked at the end of our work to evaluate whether the owner CMA agreement could be used for a single contractor project. We did find that the C32 could function in this way with a minimal amount of editing generally deleting or changing the coordination and management services that normally would be needed between multiple contractors. Next slide. Also as a reflection of current practice, the construction manager, who's really at the center of the project team, 
now has the responsibility to lead the early development of the BIM and digital data protocols. Within the E203 BIM and digital, doc, digital data exhibit, there's also a requirement for a centralized document management system, effectively a digital file cabinet. The default party in the exhibit is the architect, and in a CMA project, we felt that it was more appropriate for the construction manager to have this responsibility. Next slide. This is one of the more important changes that AI made to their 2017 and 2019 documents, and it's appropriate that it's filtered into the owner CMA agreement. With BIM and the exchange of digital data becoming commonplace, all of our agreements now emphasize the need to develop the electronic data protocols and reach agreement for the use of and reliance upon digital data. Our task group regularly heard about BIM models and data being exchanged without any agreement on its use, and this just opens up a whole bunch of potential problems. So note and take heart particularly of the second bullet point. This new requirement cautions all parties that they are at their own sole risk without liability to or from others if all or any part of the building information model now is used without the digital data agreements. And that's a very, very important point. Hasti, next slide. In the past versions of the C-132, it was unclear what level of reviews the CMA did, and at times their role seemed to be just moving information between parties. We've now expanded the CMA's reviews into design and system or material selections, particularly as these choices impact cost, schedule, and construction sequencing. The second bullet here ties into the change from our historic assumption that all contractors would be selected through bids. Again, our task group felt that any construction delivery might be used, allowing early presence of contractors and subcontractors on the project. And we believe that these firms could provide valuable input and suggestions during design. The CMA's role then will be to review and evaluate the suggestions because what might be beneficial for one contractor actually may make the work more expensive, lengthy, or complicated for another contractor. So the CMA is responsible for sorting all of this out and making a recommendation whether to accept or reject the suggestion. Last thing, next slide, please. The CMA is continually reviewing the design for cost, schedule, and constructability. As construction documents proceed, the CMA recommends how the work should be split into subcontractor and supplier bundles assuming that there's no statutory requirements, uh, there's no statutory requirements such as a separate electrical or mechanical package. The CMA also makes a recommendation which contractor will provide general condition requirements such as site security, fencing, trash disposal, and temporary facilities, all for the benefit of all of the contractors on the project. Next slide. Once construction begins, the CMA continues to provide important alignment between the contractors. In addition to reviewing shop drawings, the CMA also provides centralized coordination and reviews between the contractors to assure that the work meshes smoothly. We also expanded the CMA's responsibilities for tests and inspections. Previously, the CMA had only scheduled these but now the CMA also has to re re observe the on-site testing and inspections to assure that they are being done in the right place and on the right materials. Next slide. While AI streamlined some of the owner contractor communications in, the two in 2017 that allowed the owner to speak directly with the contractor, our group felt that there should be an exception in CMA. Because the CMA acts as that central coordinator between all of the contractors, the owner and architect still need to communicate with any contractor through the CMA. An owner still can talk directly to our CMA, but must keep the architect in the loop if the discussion includes anything about the architect's services. Supplemental services now include a number of new items that are common addition to CMA contracts that are not yet prevalent enough to be included in basic services. 
This last bullet was really a long debate in our task group. The CMA is responsible for the project's cost estimate and everybody relies upon that estimate. So now that the CMA is obligated to provide additional assistance without additional compensation, if the final pricing and packages exceed the consultant's estimate and the owner's budget. This is parallel to the architect's obligation under the B101 owner architect agreement. Next slide. Substantial completion is one of the places where the mechanics of CMA gets pretty hairy. Because there are a number of contractors on the project, should there be multiple dates of substantial completion or only one? When should the warranties in the one year correction period begin? Our task group spent a lot of time walking through this step by step. There can only be one date of capital S, capital C substantial completion because it's only at that point that an owner can occupy and begin to use the project. We still can provide multiple dates of substantial completion if the project can be split into areas that can be independently completed and occupied. This single date of substantial completion is listed in each one of the owner contractor agreements as well as being shown in the CMA's master project schedule. All warranties will start from that date, even if one of the contractors finishes their work earlier. This single date also establishes the start of time limits for things like post-construction claims or statute of repose. The CMA and each individual contractor also will define the date when the individual contractor's work must be, as we say, small, small s, small c, substantially complete. That date will be determined by the CMA to assure overall proper sequencing and flow of the work between all of the contractors. The individual date for each contractor is shown on the CMA's master project schedule and is listed in the individual owner contractor agreement. At the time the individual contractor's work is substantially complete, the CMA and architect create a punch list but no certificate of substantial completion is issued because there is only a single substantial completion date for the entire project. Susan's now going to continue with some of the updates and changes we made to the owner architect agreement used in CMA. Thank you, Arlen. We'll give your voice a little rest now. Um, and uh, I will talk about the documents that were developed to be uh, complementary to C-132, which is important because for all of the issues Arlen discussed, um, it is a unique delivery method and you need to use a coordinated set of documents. The B-132 2019 is the owner architect agreement for CMA. Uh, it was developed to reflect changes that were made on the standard owner architect agreements in the design that did build family in 2017. And then it also has some specific differences related to the responsibilities of the architect in the construction manager as advisor method. Next slide, please. Thank you, Hatsby. So the way it works, and some of this is, you know, you've heard from Arlen, but the, the construction manager performs the functions that are normally provided by a cost consultant and a scheduling consultant in B103. B103-2017 is our owner architect agreement for more complex projects and it assumes that the owner will hire a scheduling consultant and a, a cost consultant. So similarly, in C-132, the CMA performs those functions, which means the architect does not. Um, we needed a different owner architect agreement than B-103 for, C for CMA, though, because there are other roles that the CMA plays that have to be coordinated with the architect's scope. Um, the architect designs to the budget, and then as Arlen discussed, there's the assumption that more than one contractor will be performing the work. The architect's responsibility to design to the budget is limited to the estimate provided at the end of the DD phase. That's the same as in B103. And then the architect and the CMA work closely together so that the CMA can provide accurate cost estimates and a lot of the review and recommendation and analysis functions of the CM that Arlen spoke about are geared towards this collaborative effort so that the CMA can prepare accurate cost estimates. 
And then, of course, the architect and the CMA share contract administration responsibilities. Architect, um, Arlen also went over many of those items. And that is the reason why, really, we need a separate general conditions document for the CMA family, which is A232, which I will talk about uh, in a couple of minutes. Next slide, please. Now, the revisions that were made to B132 uh, generally carry forward the revisions made in the 2017 owner architect agreements. Some of these on, on the list here were already discussed by Arlen because we incorporated them into B132 and C132 where they were equally relevant. So the provisions talking about digital practice and BIM are included in B132. We now include a fill point in the initial information where the owner can identify a sustainable objective if the owner has one for the project. That's also something that's included in C132. Uh, there was a change in terminology in the owner architect agreements from bidding and negotiation phase to procurement phase because that has become the more uh, widely used terminology. And then the distinction between the supplemental and additional services that, Ar that Arlen talked about in C132 originated with the 2017 owner architect agreements just a quick review of that the owner architect agreements used to have in article 4 additional services the big table where you could check off services that the architect would provide that could be decided when you entered into the contract so maybe things like site evaluation programming historic preservation and then there was another section in article 4 that talked about additional services that could arise during the course of the project. So really they were two different things. And what we decided in 2017 was to give them different titles to make it clearer that they were different things. So the items that are listed on the chart in Article 4 now are called supplemental services. And then the items that arise during the course of the project are called additional services. And then another item that Arlen also mentioned was the option for a negotiated termination and licensing fee uh, for when there's an owner termination for convenience. And let me remind you again that we do have a webinar available on the LEARN page that talks about the 2017 revisions if you want to take a look at that to become more familiar with, with some of those. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to turn to A132-2019, which is the owner contractor agreement for CMA. Um, this is similar to B132, where updates were made based on some of the 2017 revisions. Basically, the A102 and A103, which are the owner contractor agreements, one for cost of the work with a GMP, one for cost of the work without a GMP. We also took a look at A133 and A134, which are the owner contract agreements in the CMC family. So A132 is really kind of a hybrid document. Next slide, please. But it, it's important to remember that this agreement is executed by each of the individual contractors in the CMA project. So in any of these CMA projects, you have one C-132 and one B-132 you know, for the CM and for the architect, but then you would have a number of A-132s, which are the owner contractor agreements. So as I mentioned, these were updated to conform with some of the revisions in the 2017 agreements where we had to make a change that's specific to A132 are the revisions made to the substantial completion provisions. And this, is, this addresses what Arlen already explained about how substantial completion is handled differently in the CMA family. So because you're going to have a separate A132 agreement for each contractor, we edited the section on substantial completion so that you can now provide, there's a fill point for the substantial completion date for the entire project. 
And so in each of the A132s that is executed between the owner and a different contractor, that would be the same date, substantial completion date for the entire project. But then there's also a fill point where the, the owner and the specific contractor can identify a date when the work of that contractor entering into that A132 agreement will be substantially complete. And so that might be a might and likely will be a different date in the um, in each individual A132 document. No, this is confusing. Um, hopefully, we can take some questions at the end. We have a lot of resources out there to assist you with this. This issue of substantial completion was a big one that we grappled with, as as Arlen said, and uh, someone said they thought we had threaded that needle about the best that we could. Um, there's a new insurance and bonds exhibit for A132, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes. That is now exhibit A because it would be executed for any A132. And then what used to be exhibit A, determination of the cost of the work, is now exhibit B. That exhibit would be used if the A132 has a section where you check the box for the payment method that you're going to use, and it, you can use stipulated sum, cost of the work with a, plus a fee with a guaranteed maximum price, and cost of the work plus a fee without a guaranteed maximum price. And so the mechanism in the A132 is that you check off which of those payment methods is going to be used and then it directs you to the specific sections in A132 that then apply. And if you've checked off either of the cost of the work methods, then you also use Exhibit B, determination of the cost of the work. You don't have to use Exhibit B if you're using Stip Sum as the payment method, but you would always have the insurance and bonds exhibit, and so that's why that is now Exhibit A. Next slide, please. So talking about Exhibit A, the insurance and bonds exhibit a little bit, this was first published in 2017, uh, and so that was something that followed the 2017 owner-contractor agreement. This provides the construction phase insurance requirements. Um, most, if not all, of the insurance and bond requirements in the general conditions, which here would be A232, have been moved into the exhibit. And what you have in the exhibit is the mandatory coverages that both the owner and the contractor would have to provide. Owner provides things like general liability and property insurance, the contractor provides CGL, auto, employer's liability, professional liability if there's delegated design required by the contract documents, workers' comp. And then you have a section for optional coverages where the parties can consider whether there are other insurance coverages that should be provided either by the owner or the contractor. Um, those would be things like pollution insurance or cyber insurance. And the reason we structured the document in that way is that, you know, there's certain coverages that should be included on every project, but there are other coverages that could potentially be project specific or coverages that the parties just may not have thought of that they, they look at and they say, oh yeah, we would want to include that. So the listing of the optional coverages in the insurance exhibit is meant to help spark some discussion as well about whether there should be other coverages included in the insurance for the project. And we developed this as a standalone document to make it easier for the parties to take it to their insurance advisors and be able to go through it and discuss it and then execute it uh, when they execute the agreement. Next slide, please. So the coverages that are the, I'm sorry, the requirements that are left in the A232, which are also in the A201-2017, include the obligation to purchase insurance. So that's sort of a default provision. If, they, if the parties don't complete the exhibit, it prompts them that they need to purchase insurance. 
And then things like the required not notice of cancellation or failure to obtain insurance, the waiver of subrogation, the settlement of an insured loss, which is there's a specific procedure set forth to uh, walk you through that process. Next slide, please. A232, which is the general conditions for the CMA documents. Now, this is the general conditions document that would go with the A132, which is the owner contractor agreement. So the construction contract would be the A132 and the A232 for the contractor. Um, I touched on this a little bit before. Why can't you use A201 as the general conditions in a CMA project? Well, that's because the CMA has a role in the contract administration. And so that would not be accounted for in A201. A201 Article 4 is just the architect and the architect's role in the CA services. In A232, Article 4 is titled architect and construction manager, and it includes the role of both the architect and the construction manager, which is many of the things that Arlen showed you on those tables, you know, the, the individual and the shared responsibilities in the uh, construction phase. Next slide, please. So A230. We made an eight in 2017. There's a link to the webinar that you could take a look at if you want to see more about those specific re revisions. And then basically we made changes to A232 that were consistent to the revisions that were made in the agreements, um, which we did first. We worked on the C132 and the B132 first, and then the A132, A and then conformed the A232 to those documents. Some of the changes. Um, communications between the owner and the contractor or contractors go through the CMA. Uh, the Article 4 edits are consistent with the scope revisions that Arlen talked about in C-132. Some of the language was edited to clarify the way that substantial completion is handled. And then the Article 11 uh, insurance section, which was changed as I just discussed with respect to the exhibit. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Hosty. Thank you. So now the E235 2019 Sustainable Projects Exhibit for CMA. Um, this is a new exhibit developed this year, generally follows from the E204 2017, which was the Sustainable Projects Exhibit developed for the 2017 release. Next slide, please. So basically, we took the E204, which is the design the build version of a sustainable projects exhibit, except the only parties included in that are the owner, the contractor, and the architect. Here, of course, we had to include the role of the CMA throughout the project. And so um, we developed a new sustainable project exhibit specifically for CMA. Next slide, please. And I'll, I'll be brief on this because we're run, running a little bit low on time now. And many of you may already be familiar with our, the way our sustainable projects documents have worked going all the way back to when we originally published our D503 in 2011. Um, we have developed a process to achieve the owner's sustainable objective. That involves additional scope for both the architect and the CM. The architect conducts a, sustainable, a sustainability workshop prior to the end of schematic design. The CMA, in this case, attends that workshop and they develop a sustainability plan which provides the specific requirements for each of the parties on the project to achieve the owner's sustainable objective. So this provides you know, a roadmap for how to get from the sustainable objective to how to achieve it. If any of you have used our, we have published what we call sustainable projects versions of 
the documents. We have them for the CM family. Um, and so if any of you have used them, we basically extracted the scope items and the other items from those documents and incorporated them into this exhibit. Those SP documents will also be retired when the 2019, uh, when the 2009 versions are retired. Um, the Sustainable Project Exhibit also addresses key risk factors that might be specific to these types of projects, things like substitutions, failure to achieve the, cer the certification, and consequential damages. And there is a provision in all of the agreements in this family that the parties will use E234 if the owner identifies a sustainable objective in the agreement. So Arlen is now going to take you through the last few of the documents that we have updated for this uh, this release. Thank you, Susan. Um, let's take a quick look at the forms used in CMA delivery. Again, as a reminder, the G series always are the con contract administration and project management forms for each AI document family. Next slide, Hostey. Many of these are going to be familiar to you from the BID and CMC projects, but we've coordinated them for the additional complexity that results from the CMA and multiple prime contractors. Also note that we changed the document numbers on three of the forms to be consistent with the AI document numbering systems. Next slide. The CMA is located on the project site during construction and initiates many of the forms. They compile and review the information prior to sending it to the architect for review. And this includes pay applications and the change order forms. Uh, for example, we've tweaked the, the content of a few forms as we talked about it, like the certificate of substantial completion, where we clarified the wording to be consistent with the single date of substantial completion that applies to all contractors. Next slide. Uh, preparing the general conditions and agreements for construction is quite a challenge. I've been doing it for 30 years and each project has a little bit different set of circumstances and requirements. So AI publishes a guide for supplemental conditions that helps prepare the documents and then offers model language for special situations. The guide's available at no cost and you can find it on the AIA documents under the Learn tab in Guides. Next slide. There are two different supplementary condition documents that you'll find there, so you want to be absolutely clear which one to use. The A503 is used for CMC and traditional bid agreements along with the A201 general conditions, and then the 533 is for use in the CMA agreements and A232 general conditions. For decades, both of those general conditions were premised upon a fixed cost or low bid construction delivery, but as we've discussed, we now know that construction can be provided in a number of different ways, including cost of the work arrangements. So I was part of a small work group that spent a couple of years asking, first, were there modifications needed in the general conditions document for cost of the work agreements? And second, would these modifications make the general conditions more responsive and clear for cost of the work projects? We did feel that there were some changes that would allow these to function better, and we've placed these changes in a separate appendix in each guide. Susan, back to you for the balance of the presentation. Thank you, Arlen, and we only have about a minute left, so I'm not sure we'll have time to take any questions, but if not, please feel free to send any questions you may have to Hosti, and we will try to get back to you with the answers, or hopefully you might find answers in some of the resources I'm about to talk with you about. Um, and let me also mention the documents we're discussing today, the Construction Manager's Advisor Family Documents, will be published early next year. So. Um, don't go out looking for them today. They'll be available early next year. The construction manager as constructor documents, the other family are already available. They were published a few weeks ago. So we have lots of resources available for you. Again, we've mentioned the Learn page where you can view other webinars to help you. Questions about document content, you can contact our DocInfo service. And for questions about our ACD online service, 
you can contact our tech support folks. Next. Um, okay, so these are the two webinars that Arlen and I have presented, including today's. And again, you can view them at this link on the Learn page. Next slide, please. There are comparisons available now for the CMC documents. Those basically show in track changes, the revisions made to the 2009 documents to convert them to the 2019 documents. And there are also FAQs available. Next slide, please. And there will be comparisons available for the CMA documents. Also, we will put each document up on the website showing the revisions that were made in track changes, which makes it very easy for you to see uh, what the revisions were. And we will also be posting FAQs on these documents. Next slide. So with that, thank you very much from all of us at AIA Contract Documents. And we'll turn it back over to Hasti. Thank you very much, Susan and Arlen, and thank you all for joining us. Just a reminder that this uh, webinar is eligible for one AIA learning unit. If you're an AIA member, your credit will be reported uh, within a week. Also, you'll receive a follow-up email with the recording and the PowerPoint from today's presentation by the end of this week. You'll also be able to, as Susan mentioned, access all of our on-demand webinars on our LEARN page. With that, thank you very much for your interest and have a great afternoon.